Hey guys, Mike here. So today we get to answer all your questions and feel free to participate in this one. And you have some good ones. We're talking about NVIDIA, the AI bubble, and I'll show you two really uh, cool things, uh, which hopefully you get something out of. Also, someone's asking about, you know, what's low float stocks. I'm gonna show you something and I'll guarantee you, you will start looking for these stocks after you see this uh, because it's, it's pretty insane. Uh, the gains that some of these get, and you've heard of these companies, by the way. Uh, we'll also go into, uh, as well, talking about energy, because I think something's about to happen there as well, and then a couple more. So, uh, like we usually do, let's just get right into it, and feel free to participate and uh, add on to the conversation and ask any more questions you have as well. Maybe I'll put them in next Saturday's video, okay? So, here we go. And the first one says, how long can this bubble, if that's what we're in, keep going? Seems like a few stocks leading the market are getting very stretched. And bubbles, if that's what you want to call this AI thing right here, can go on for quite a while. And what I'm going to do is show you uh, one thing that's you're going to see, like Dan Niles here talk about this. I think this is one thing that will bring things to a head very quickly. And I've been saying this for probably a year and a half now. And then we'll go into something I share with the members. When you're looking at the really the, the last bubble, we went through the internet bubble, right? The dot com bubble. I'll show you that. What's eerily similar from there? to here and i just shared it with members uh last week so check this out at some point it comes down to earnings and guess what in about two weeks we're going to start three weeks i guess we're going to start having these companies start to report numbers and what we saw which is easy to forget because you talk about the market hitting new all-time record highs and all the rest of it is you've had some very big companies talk miss numbers and i'm talking salesforce workday ServiceNow, MongoDB, so companies that report off quarter that, you know, reported their April results, those companies all came out and had issues. And these were some of the darlings, you know, over the last five, arguably 10 years, where software is eating the world, et cetera, and the demand for these what they offer is insatiable, and all of a sudden the numbers are coming down. And so the thing you have to ask yourself is, you spent a lot on AI. Every company has to say AI 50 to 100 times on their conference calls. And by the way, those four companies did. And But now you've got to show if their results and the spend that you've had about 50 billion or so, let's say last year on AI and the revenues you've generated, which is about 3 billion, according to Sequoia, which by the way, was the early VC investor in NVIDIA in 1993, when that stock was valued at less than $15 million, they put something out talking about this. So I think in a couple, in a few weeks, we're going to come to a Jesus moment. And I think that's when the broadening out starts because not every company is NVIDIA and it's a very short list of names that are having estimates go up. Their stocks might be going up, but the numbers aren't necessarily going higher. And so I think that's the trigger, which is earning. Because you're going to have to look at, well, am I getting any return on investment? And we've had four very large software companies, which all, by the way, were touting the benefits of AI, cut the numbers. And I think he's totally right about the earnings part. And I've been talking about that for a year and a half. And I'm going to elaborate that on just a minute. But really, two things to watch. Just watch SMH, right? Your semiconductor ETF right here. Obviously, it's straight up like a... A cliff, I guess you could say, as we keep pumping and pumping and pumping. But if we continue to get this pullback and have weakness coming up in the early week right here, you know, watch this 21 EMA right there, actually 21 SMA, excuse me, and watch that gap right there. So you have a fair value gap, a gap right below, and that's where the 21 is probably going to meet it coming up in the next week. So that would be a good area for a bounce if we are going to get some kind of weakness here. Because again, if you didn't see my video, June 20th or June 27th is normally very weak, seven red out of the last uh, 10 years uh, during that week right there. And so just keep an eye on that one because we are super stretched. We're starting to see a little weakness there finally and profit taken because they're up huge. Uh, and you can see, I mean, that's really where you want to look at right there. And then, you know, that will be roughly about a 9% drop. Then the other one is the eight stocks, which I do with this ticker right here, which has two semiconductors in it and plus your big boys, Microsoft, Apple and all that good stuff as well to watch this to pull back because what's right there below a huge gap okay so you have this enormous gap so if this is a group starts to roll over coming up this week and not go down too much right you'll see a nice big dump down almost like 10 percent for the group or whatever which that would be good and that's what you need for the market to even consolidate or go down at all okay so watch those two tickers right there that area right there will make a good interest and everything there's your 21 sma coming up right there and so, you know, let's see if that happens. But here's something I share with members of how eerily similar 
1988 and 1989 are to what's going on right now and what to look out for? Obviously, breath like this in a long time as far as the market sucking and being so concentrated, right, in quite a while. But this is the percentage of stocks in the S&P that outperform the S&P 500 index, right? And you haven't seen it this low since 1998, 1999. Why is that interesting? Because that was in the dot-com bubble or leading up to the dot-com bubble. And here's what's interesting about it. 98, 99, obviously that's leading up to the dot-com bubble, right? What do you have right here? What happened in July 98? Hmm. Oh, we sold off going in October. That looks interesting. Then we went on this huge run-up, right, going through that year. And then, of course, that right there is the start of the dot-com crash. All right. So, of course, what was happening? We had the Internet boom going on, a lot of worthless companies out there, a lot more than you see now, really. Uh, but what's interesting, now we move up to current date, right? We'll go to actually we'll go to 2023. And, you know, what do you see here? Well, hmm, this can be like 1998, right? We're going this big run, AI pumping, but then we sold off in July, going into October. And then what we do, went on a huge run up, right? And as you can see, I mean, absolutely euphoric run we've been on here. But then we go back and we look at 1999. We say, okay, we're in June now, so technically like 2024 would be like 1999, right, according to that chart. And we go back and we say, okay, man, nice run up right here, as you can see. Well, what's this right here? Hmm, well, that's July. What happened in July? We sold off again, right? We had a great June, and then we sold off, going back down to what? October, once again. Then we went on, nice big run up until it imploded. Right, going and it went up for quite a while actually. <laughs> you can see how much it went up for quite a while, almost a full year it looked like right there. Well, of course, we come back here and we say, Well, what else is going on that's kind of unique to that? Well, they were going through a rate hiking cycle. You see that right there? They were going through a rate hiking cycle and even leading up to the dot com crash, they were raising rates again. It was done a little differently back then. Again, the Fed didn't own the market. The government didn't own the market. They weren't running the debt up like unbelievably. The Fed didn't, you know, wasn't injecting trillions of dollars or trying to save the bond market or anything back then. But again, they were in a rate hiking cycle in those two years leading up to that crash right there, that euphoric crash. And so I found that very interesting, and it really kind of compares to what we're going through now in a way, right? And so bubbles can pump and pump and pump and, you know, all that good stuff. But, you know, right now the dips are getting bought up. We'll see if this week gets bought up because usually July, pretty good. I'll show you guys that probably in about a week or so. I just shared that with members. So, I mean, that's uh, pretty good stuff there. So we'll see. I mean, let me know what you think. Again, we're hitting those round numbers, starting to see, you know, finally getting some pullback. But they're still getting bought up, right? So... We'll see what happens on those. Let me know what you think about that uh, part of the members video I just showed you as well uh, on that correlation. So uh, next one here, uh, T. Wood says, question for next week, what is a low float stock? I think is what he's talking about. And why does it cause such a violent spring? And it's simply supply and demand. You look at Wing, right? And you come down here, that thing's at $406. Why? Sitting there at 28 million shares of a float, 29 million shares, outstanding. SMCI, you know this one got to 1,000 sitting over 50 million float right there. Uh, you go over here and you look at uh, pizza, for example, which is Domino's Pizza, up to 516, 34 million float right there. Then you go over something like NVIDIA. You know, big deal. I mean, it's had a lot of stock splits. It'd be a huge in price, but it has 23 billion, right? And so when you look at this, it's the percentage gains you can have. That's what you gotta look at. It's like Ween, for example. Look at these percentages. It's from 2015 to 2024, so nine years, 2,400% in gains, right? You come over here and you'll see Domino's Pizza. In a freaking eight year span, this thing did 5,176%. That is insane percentage gains. You come over to SMCI, look at this one. Oh my goodness, straight up, right? 3,463% in a matter of not even two years. Not even two years. Then you go over to NVIDIA, the AI king. Same time frame, right? Look at this one. Great gains, 1,135%, but you saw what SMCI did, right? So it's simply supply and demand. If big money gets behind a, a stock, they'll have many, many outstanding shares, like 25, 50 million, and then this over here has 3 billion, 4 billion, 7 billion, 8 billion, like Chipotle, right? Chipotle, thank you. That right there has a very low float, but it's about to do a 50 for one stock split. So they were able to push this stock from 42 to 3,000. 
since it IPO'd. And what's fixing to happen though? They're fixing to have like a billion and something, one and a half billion shares outstanding, right? And so big difference in trying to push up if big money gets behind a stock that has 50 million shares or 25 million shares outstanding, that's the percentage gain that you can get. It's insane. Here's the difference though. There's a downfall to it. So when they turn, they are gonna lose way more than your normal stocks, okay? Way more, you're gonna get wrecked, okay? That's just the way it is. And so that's why you see that. So they're very high risk. That's why a lot of people don't even look for them, don't try to use them. I do kind of find it funny that a lot of them, and you gotta look for them really on the Russell or uh, the Russell 3000, 2000, 3000, either one. But it's funny to me, a lot of those you point, I look at are restaurants. I don't know why that is. It could be a coincidence. I'm sure there's many others that do it. But those are, you know, well known out there, and so that's why I say a lot of you people will start. A lot of y'all will start looking for those now because it is like a different world. But you better have some very high risk tolerance and know when to get the heck out. Okay, so that's what low float's all about. Now, next one here says H Coleman, Mike, enjoy your honesty. What are your thoughts on the oil sector? The U.S. has been using the oil reserves, but to my understanding, we haven't started filling it back up. Are we making a big mistake, taking a huge risk? I'll answer both these questions for you. Ready? So when it comes to energy, I'd say watch out because, you know, some people want to call this a bullish flag, a down sending channel, which usually does what? Results in going up, right? And it's coming to an area on XLE where you've seen it, you know, an area of interest, right? Where you see the selling, it's been the tops quite a bit right here. Could there start being some buying? It bounced on the 200. And so, you know, you could see a breakout here on this one. If you go over and look at oil, you're seeing something very similar right here. When we pull up oil, Again, wedge and wedge and wedge and rejection, 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 breakout, false breakout, come back down. Now we're testing that trend line again. And so we're setting what? Higher lows, right? Over the last probably like a year. And so this one right here can start to break out. It's over all those moving averages at the 50 and the 200 start to turn up because the 100 just crossed the 200 right there. Then you can start to see a breakout, but you got to get above that fair value gap right there. And you could be off to the races, which would be actually really bad <laughs> for consumers in a way. And I'll show you why. But, you know, when you look at it, what's crazy about XLE and oil is what happens before a recession. If they think there's going to be a recession, too. Here's 2022 when they thought there was going to be a recession. What happened? XLE ran up, right? You go 2008, XLE runs up, it even keeps going into the recession. 2000.com, same thing. It runs up. Now I got to switch over to oil as it goes a little bit farther back than this. But when you see, you see the same thing. It ran up in 2022, ran up to 2008, ran up into uh, the dot-com bubble. Same thing. Ran up into, I believe it was 1990, if I'm not mistaken. And so they, and somebody told me why. Look at that right there. And so, again, it doesn't, I can't get to go farther back than that. But still, this stuff runs up. And so, again, if it starts to run, it starts to break out. A lot of people are predicting anywhere from recession to go from anywhere like September-ish, maybe into like January if it happens or something like that. But again, we got a lot of stuff to happen. So watch out for that. But here's what's really nuts about the oil reserve stuff, the argument, right, is the fact that we are so, I don't say tribal, I say cult-like, is because, guess what? Remember when gas prices were sky high? Do you know how we got the gas prices down? The president, again, I don't care if it's Santa Claus up there, did something I don't think any of the president's actually done, said, well, we can't get him to drill for more oil as the CEOs were bragging about record profits, right? And so here's what, we're gonna release the oil reserves. Here's what's crazy about that. He hinted at releasing the oil reserves on March 31st, did not do it. Gas prices started dropping just on the hint, but then he did it. And look at this right here, look at gas prices. They go here, June 13, 2022. Look how fast they went down by December. It was a 40% drop, probably a 30% drop in the first like two months. But I say we're cultish because guess what happened? I had people around me complaining about it. They were like, my God, releasing the old reserves. What if it was an emergency? I'm like, what do you call this? What do you call five, six, seven, eight dollars of gas per gallon? What do you call that? For me, it wasn't an emergency, not my family, probably not you either. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck, which is at least one third, if not more of our country, that is a freaking emergency, right? Doubling your gas bill at the pump, especially if you got a long drive away. My mom used to, uh, we, she made minimum wage, used to drive an hour there, an hour back every day. You know how much gas that is? So if your gas bill all of a sudden doubles for your car, that's an emergency, okay? But you couldn't get them to drill anymore. The president couldn't, can't force, why I keep telling people when somebody's saying drill, 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 you can't force these companies to drill more unless there is a, an emergency of which then the president does have special powers. I read some 1982 article on this, listed out every single thing they have. 
prime example is when Bush was in office in 2001, whatever it was, and there was an oil shortage or something, and gas prices just started trying to spike, and he came out on national TV and said, hey, because Shell and Chevron, all their gas, they were trying to just like run the gas prices up. And he said, what the price is today, the price is tomorrow, not a penny more. And if you do, we're going to prosecute you at the federal level. And all of a sudden, bam, good to go, right? Stabilize the prices. Didn't happen. Okay. So again, presidents, if it's a state of emergency, they have special powers, which they can enact. I don't know if they can force people to drill. But they can also, how much we export, they can cut that back, all kinds of stuff. So there's ways to go. Now, I think the the petroleum reserves, what are down like 50%, whatever it is. Do they need to start filling it back up? Yep, sure do. I mean, sure. But to me, I look at it this way. Because I know about, you know, if there's an emergency or we're in a state of war, somebody invades us, they do, the Congress and the president have special powers, which they can at least try to enact, right? The other one is, I look at it this way. By not releasing those reserves, that's like getting a huge pay cut at work, but the bills stay the same price, like all your expenses stay the same price, but your income comes down and you got an emergency savings account sitting there, right? An emergency fund. And you say, ah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tap it, right? And so all of a sudden, because you make less pay now and your bills stay the same, they start going into delinquency. And your wife's going, or your husband, please, please use it. No, 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 we'll be okay. And meanwhile, your house is getting foreclosed on. Right. That's that's kind of the equivalent of that to me. It, it just makes no sense. Makes no sense. But again, that's how <laughs> again, I don't care if Trump, Biden, Santa Claus, the president do what you got to do to bring down the gas prices. Right. I don't know. And people still complain, no matter who's not, because their side didn't do it. So therefore, they have to complain about that. That's it's just idiotic. To me. I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. So, yeah. So do we need to start filling them up eventually? Yeah, absolutely. The thing you got to watch out for, though, is. How fast they fill them up? We're talking about hundreds of millions of barrels. They're going to, have to replenish, right? What's going to happen if all of a sudden demand skyrockets because the government's sitting there trying to refill at too rapid a pace? Is gas prices going to go back up? That's what we got to figure out, right? Now, last one says, "Hey, Mike, for Saturday's video, will you go over XLRE? Also, what do you think real estate and REIT stocks will do when interest rates go down?" And I'll say this about the REITs: it depends on what kind of REIT you hold. Right. So if they cut rates, but we're in a recession, the REITs that hold like public storage units and apartments, I'm not going to say they're going to skyrocket or anything, but they're going to hold up the best because in recessions, people downside, they put stuff in storage, they move out of the houses and go into an apartment normally. Right. If you look at the past recessions, if they cut rates and we're not going to recession, it's a Goldilocks thing and everything's going to be hunky dory. Well, commercial real estate REITs, right, might do really well because they've been getting hammered. OK, because they're like a nuclear mess right now. OK, they're kind of um, what's wrong with a radioactive. <laughs> so maybe uh, those do well. Again, it, it just depends on the cut rates. Did they break something? Because it seems like they're definitely going to hold these for longer uh, than most people thought. Or are we going to this Goldilocks thing? That's what we got to figure out when it comes to this stuff. But anyway, that's the whole rate cut thing. That's a ways off. And who knows what's going to happen when we get there? You know, 99% of the time they've broken something and it's not good, but we'll see if they can, you know, thread the, the needle or whatever. So hope you guys got something out of it. Please leave any, any more questions uh, or please answer any of those questions you want to and add on to it. Uh, love doing this video and stuff for you guys. Do me a favor. Please hit the like and subscribe button on the way out. And I will see you guys tomorrow to set up the week.